Thank you very much. I also thank you for, uh, again, choosing, uh, choosing this time over the Blues game. Um, and if my phone buzzes, I'll try not to pay attention to the updates coming from that. Uh, so again, my name is Mike Swartout. I'm at uh, Parks College at St. Louis University. I want to talk about uh, CubeSats, but really spacecraft in general, and especially with so many uh, youngsters in the room. Um, I want to also try to pepper this in talking about how I got to where I am in terms of uh, an engineering career, but also in being involved with space. And um, this is the general agenda of what I want to talk about tonight. But I want to make uh, plenty of time for discussion. I find, in, especially in these venues, uh, what you've come here to learn is usually much more interesting than what I think you have come here to learn. Um, uh, on a related note, I went over this talk a lot with my wife recently, and she kept saying, less technical, more interesting. So if this is interesting, we can give her the credit. If it's technical and, and very boring, I'll take responsibility for that. But again, as it's laid out here, what I want to talk about, give you some background of space missions and, and my own background, uh, to talk about what is this thing that I'm calling a CubeSat and why does it matter. Um, we'll look at briefly at the history, looking at the kinds of missions that have been flown, finally getting around to, to having this question and a uh, toy tool and debris cloud, and then the discussion. And related to the discussion, if you have questions or if there's something confusing, uh, as we go, feel free to ask that question. If I can answer directly, I will. Some of the things we'll just save for the time at the end. But I want to make sure that I give plenty of time uh, for you to have any sorts of questions or discussion that you want. So let me jump in with the background here uh, to talk about my own background and then uh, a couple of, of charts and discussions about spacecraft. So who am I? Uh, I am, uh, came from Stanford University's small satellite program. Uh, Bob Twiggs' name will show up later. Uh, he is one of the founders of this area at CubeSats. Um, it was work that was, I can't take any responsibility for it, uh, but it was work that was being done in our lab that led him to create this, this new concept for small spacecraft. And I've had the privilege of working with lots of, of other students on building and flying a number of spacecraft. So the first one I worked on called Sapphire, we launched it in 2001. And then I was for a while a professor at Washington University and then moved down the road to St. Louis, St. Louis University. And in both places, I'd had the opportunity to work on student satellite projects, now as a faculty mentor instead of the student. So we've had a couple more spacecraft launched at St. Louis University, and we have our third that will be delivered to be released off the space station in the fall. So what I do, I, I, my main study is this sort of thing in terms of understanding small satellites. Why do they work? What happens when they don't work? Uh, trying to <clears throat> get a better understanding of this particular branch of, of spacecraft. So let's start really broad, and we'll narrow in. So uh, this is roughly the scale, not the planets themselves, but the, the, the numbers here, the distances here. We're here. Uh, this is the inner solar system. Uh, so as you can see, we've got uh, Earth, Venus, Mercury, and Mars forming the inner planets. Uh, you may often see this distance of 1 AU, which is a, a, a unit of distance. Um, but we're mainly focusing on spacecraft that are going to be operating near the Earth. And in fact, if we zoom in, um, this is to scale. So this is the Earth and the Moon and the distance between them all in pretty close to, to uh, an accurate scale. Uh, and mainly in terms of context, I'm pointing out that as far as humans have gone, we have made it no further than here. There have been 24 people to make it out to the Moon. Everyone else in the entire recorded history of humanity has been down here, and in fact, if we zoom in a little bit more, we've all been inside this green circle. I don't have the time to talk about human exploration. That's a whole other topic. Maybe you'll invite me back and we can talk about that. Um, so for today, I'm mainly talking, or actually exclusively talking about robotic spacecraft, uh, and I'm in fact mostly talking about the ones that are going to be in this green circle. Uh, but just for context, this orange circle is what's called geostationary orbit. This is where all of the spacecraft, uh, they, they circle around the Earth at the same rate that the Earth rotates. And so from us sitting on the ground, they look like they're fixed. Uh, this is where if you have a satellite dish on your roof, it's pointing to one of the spacecraft that are going to be on this orange band. Um, anything closer than that is going to be moving around the Earth at a different speed compared to the rotation of the Earth, and so it's going to look like it crosses the sky relative to our position. 
So if we're trying to say, see the International Space Station, the reason why it flies overhead is that it's in much closer, it's going faster, and it's going at a faster rate than the Earth's turning. And so that's why it's only overhead for a short period of time. So that's the space environment, but there are other environments that affect space, most notably money. And I think a useful thing to understand in terms of context here, especially for those of us that have been around for a while and are used to back in the 60s and 70s when defense and space drove the technological developments, uh, it's very different now. And so just as a point of comparison, uh, two years ago in fiscal year 2017, NASA's total budget was $19 billion. In one quarter, so just one quarter of the year, uh, Apple's net income, meaning profit, was uh, $9 billion. So that was just for one quarter of the year. And so on average, Apple has more profit than NASA's entire budget. Just give you a sense of where the money is available to do research and development and where people are spending their money. And especially if you're a hot shot new battery developer, do you want to build something for the iPhone or do you want to build something for a spacecraft? There's a lot more opportunities to get involved in the personal electronic industry. Another way to look at it is how many of these things are being made? So as I said, uh, in 2015, there were 1.4 billion smartphones made. So that's not how many there were, that's how many were produced in that year alone. Compared to 1,300 wide-body jets by Airbus or Boeing, and there were only 85 rockets launched, and that's for the entire world. So uh, not meant to be depressing, but to, to point out that uh, in terms of understanding our, our basic assumptions on how important these things are in the world economy, how much attention is going to be given to one versus another. Perhaps the depressing way to say it, as I say to my students, it's unprofitable to dedicate manufacturing lines to space-specific products. And so in the 60s and 70s, the technology push was from space to the rest of your life. Now the technology push is from the rest of your life to space. And so that's kind of a background of what we're going to see when we talk about CubeSats. Also, I think it's helpful to talk about, well, what do we do in space? Why go there in the first place? The first one, I think it comes at the top of the list, is the idea of science and exploration. We're going there to learn. We want to see what's on the other side of the hill. We want to see if there was or was ever or is now life on Mars. We want to understand how the Earth's magnetic field <coughs> behaves when the sun, the solar storm hits it so that we can uh, better protect, protect our spacecraft, better protect our electronics. So a lot of science and exploration. The number two thing, and in fact, really the only way to make money in space is communications. So your direct broadcast television, your, your satellite dish, a lot of other forms of communications are being relayed through space systems. And so that is a, a major emphasis of what's done in space. Earth imaging which can be done for scientific purposes, it can be done for uh, better maps on your phone, it can be done for reconnaissance, but there's a lot of effort in taking pictures of the Earth and then also measuring other things about the Earth. Uh, the US military, and in fact all of the military uh, agencies in the world do signals intelligence and so they'll collect information. You can think spy satellites, uh, other sorts. There's actually a lot of education that's done uh, with space missions. We'll talk more about that. This is one of the primary uh, activities with these things called CubeSats. Technology demonstrations. And the idea really with a technology demonstration is we're going to go try out something new so that we can do one of these things better. There have been other interesting missions. There have been a couple of art projects, primarily a, a number of Japanese institutions and universities have flown art projects recently in space. There have been some space burials where someone's ashes or portions of have been launched uh, and are now orbiting the Earth. So there, there have been some unusual effects as well. The other thing I want to do just to help put context in what's coming later is to remind us uh, about what's going on in terms of an orbit. Um, and if you think back to Newton's laws, without gravity, if I have, is this my spacecraft and I'm going in this direction, I'm just going to go that way forever. An object in motion stays in motion unless it's acted on. And so if I'm zipping along at 20,000 miles an hour, I'm just going to keep going off to the right, never to return. However, if I'm close to the Earth, then there's a gravitational pull that takes place. And so gravity is that green line pulling me down. And, and the, the effect is, is that it bends my flight. So as I go around the Earth, 
my motion keeps getting turned or bent. Now, because of the way it's, it works out, there's no energy loss, and so this can go on forever. And so if I have the right combination of distance and speed, I can keep circling the Earth forever. Now, these numbers, I think, are useful because, mostly because they're so unusual for what we, we tend to do. Um, if you want to go into free fall around the Earth, this right combination means you're going about 18,000 miles per hour. Faster if you're a little closer, slower the further out you get. But as you can imagine, most objects don't like to go from zero to 18,000 miles per hour. They will fight you uh, as you try to push them and speed them up that much. So in fact, getting to orbit is, yes, you have to go higher, but if you look at energy, only 10% of your energy is in going higher. 90% of your energy is in going faster. So here's a little thing if you're watching the next uh, pretty amazing SpaceX video of a rocket launch, which I do definitely. Uh, if you watch them, you'll notice that very quickly they go up and then they start what we call pitching over and they start going more and more horizontal. Almost immediately after clearing the tower, they start to angle their ascent. And the reason is, is that they need all of that rocket thrust going sideways to speed up. And so that's why they're doing it. So, what I find, because I teach a couple of courses in orbits and spacecraft design, and so I have these five rules of thumb that help my students understand what's going on. Um, so these are my laws of spaceflight. Uh, take that as you will. Uh, the first is you cannot overestimate how much launch dominates or messes up everything else. Launch is the driver or the obstacle against space activities. And it comes back to sort of the second law. The laws of physics are philosophically opposed to space flight. Um, others have put it in different phrases, but the basic idea, as I said, is in order to get into orbit, we need to go, we need to speed up by 18,000 miles per hour. And objects don't like to do that. It's very easy to burn them up. It's very easy to crash. Lots of things can go wrong as you're trying to go from zero to 18,000 miles per hour. As one of uh, the chief engineers of SpaceX, when they were doing their rocket development, said, uh, when we light that rocket, there are a thousand things that can happen, and only one of them is good. Um, and, and so this gets into what I think of the third law here. Nothing ever works the first time you try it. And that's not true of space. That's true of you're putting together a car a model car for the first time, you're putting together your computer, you're trying out something new, you've installed your dishwasher, something was probably going to go wrong during that process and it will always take you more time than you expected. Uh, the reality is when you're dealing with complicated parts and you're trying to get them all to play well together, things crop up. Uh, there's never enough time or money to do everything you want to do before launch. Uh, eventually, uh, as one of my mentors had said, there comes a time in every project to shoot the engineers and begin production. At some point, you just have to say, this is as good as we're gonna be able to get it done. We, we need to move on to launch. And then I say, fear governs all decisions. And let me explain or give you some examples of why. So, th speaking of SpaceX, uh, even Elon Musk will say, SpaceX was basically one more failed launch from never being a thing. Uh, back in early 2004, they were doing their, one of their first launches, which is the Falcon 1. Uh, this is a grainy photo of that launch. So here is the rocket body, here's the engine, here's the rocket nozzle, and this is not supposed to be happening. That's fire and flames on the outside of the rocket. The fire's all supposed to be down here. And what happened was that there was a fuel line here that had come loose, and so the fuel was all spilling and combusting on the outside of the rocket, which obviously caused it to fail. Um, and that fuel line failed because a nut that cost $5 had corroded and cracked. They were launching out of the South Pacific. It had been sitting on the pad for a while. The nut corroded, it cracked, it fell off on launch. And so it was a $15 million mission that failed because of a $5 part. There are numerous examples of very small parts, very small pieces. Uh, someone forgets, leaves a rag in the fuel line. Um, parts fall apart and so you can think of it as one of the things that we're most concerned about is teeny tiny parts can kill big missions. So you have to have a tremendous attention to detail because the smallest detail 
can lead to the failure of the launch. Um, I apologize, some of these images, because the, the examples I use are from missions from the 2000s and the 90s, and back then we didn't have high definition, and so we're going to have some, on any resolution, these are going to be some grainy shots here. There was a mission called SMEX, um, and basically it's a little hard to see, but there was a sun shield here because it was an uh, infrared telescope, and it couldn't look at the sun. They had a whole set of rules and procedures about not staring at the sun, because if they stared at the sun, with this, uh, with this imager, it would burn it out. Well, sure enough, they launched, and when they turned it on, the process of turning it on, there was a signal that was sent through the system that mimicked the command to release the shield on this telescope. They had never seen it before because they'd never had the time to put everything together and do the test because they would have had to fire the pyros and it would have been very expensive and, and very difficult. So they ran pieces of the test, but nothing all together. And so what happened was a, a weird little blip on, the, on this thing when you turn it on. If you ever turn on your car and all of the gauges go back and forth, back and forth, and then settle out, it's the same kind of thing. There, when you turn something on, there's some electrical noise that happens. Well, that noise caused the shield to pop off. It stared at the sun. All of its coolant boiled off within a matter of moments. And there was no mission left. Uh, so. Failure to pay attention to the initial conditions, which would never, ever happen again. This was a one-time problem. If they got past this problem, there was never going to be a problem again. But because it was a one-time problem and they missed it, they killed the mission. So back in the 80s, there were these communication satellites called ANIC E1 and E2. And they were on opposite sides of the, of the Earth. So here's the Earth, and here are your two spacecraft. And what happened was that in orbit, within a few seconds of each other, both of these spacecraft failed. And you say, how in the world, literally, could two spacecraft on opposite sides of the planet, in fact, 70,000 kilometers or 45,000 miles apart, how could they fail? Well, what happened was that there was, the sun was particularly angry that day, and so it was kicking off a lot of particles in the solar wind. And those particles caused electricity to build up on one teeny tiny little chip. Unfortunately, that teeny tiny little chip was controlled which way the spacecraft pointed. And so as the static charge built up and built up and built up, as you've done as you've walked across the room and you know, touched your brother, uh, it caused a giant spark which burnt out the chip. And so suddenly both of these spacecraft stopped pointing in the right direction. They basically started tumbling uncontrolled. And that was the end of the mission. So you can think of static electricity killed an entire mission. But wait, there's more. Uh, there was a, another mission in the 80s, called, excuse me, in the 70s called Landsat 4. After a few weeks on orbit, it started acting really strangely. It started losing a lot of power, and they finally figured out what happened was that on the solar panels, they have to have cables that run everything back to the rest of the spacecraft. And they had done all the tests. They had heated up those cables. They had made them very cold to handle all of the extremes of, of temperature in space. They had worked just fine. What they hadn't accounted for was the cycling, because they go in the sun, they heat up, they expand. They go into, in behind the Earth, they cool off and contract. And that heating and cooling and heating and cooling caused them, because they had bends in them, to start cracking. And so it was, it was, they had designed it and tested it to be hot, it was fine. Cold, it was fine. They hadn't tested it for the cycling. And so now every spacecraft is tested for the cycling. So wire harness. No one goes into, no, no one comes to my program and saying, I want to be a wire harness engineer. That's what I really want to do. Uh, but it turns out if you do it wrong, your $20 million mission is gone. And actually, we've had two alumni that are now wire harness engineers for SpaceX. And they're really excited because whenever you see them dock at the space station, you can look on the back side and they say, that's mine. I made that. I live vicariously through them. <coughs> Excuse me. So, two more, and then we'll, we'll get back onto the main mission here. So, it's not just the Americans that have these problems. This is a Soviet program back in the 60s, Mars 4, 5, 6, and 7. They were four consecutive missions to Mars. Um, in an effort to save money, they, because usually you use gold in your sensitive electronics because it has very nice electrical properties, it has very nice thermal properties, they were a little short on cash, and so one of their enterprising engineers figured out a way to use aluminum in some of the places and gold in the rest. They said, fantastic. They put this on all four of these spacecraft, and then they discovered a problem. 
which is called the Purple Plague, which I think is a great name. And the Purple Plague is when you take two metals and you put them next to each other, they start growing crystals spontaneously on them. And those crystals are electrically conductive, uh, which means that eventually, and that's what this is, is that this is a picture of an, a, a circuit board and these growths are getting bigger and bigger and eventually they grow so big that they start connecting parts of your circuit board that aren't supposed to be connected. And so you get electrical shorts and it burns the whole thing out. The problem for the poor engineer who discovered this was that they, they figured this out uh, right before launch. And they, they, they calculated that it was going to take roughly 18 months, I'm sorry, it was going to take roughly nine months for these crystal growths to, to grow to the point where it would cause a short. The time to fly from Earth to Mars, nine months. If they didn't launch, they were going to have to wait two years and the Americans would get things there first. And so they had this decision of, well, do we roll the dice? Because, you know, if we're slightly lucky, then we'll get there, we'll do the mission, and then they'll die. If we're unlucky, they'll die on the way. They said, well, might as well give it a shot and they died on the way. <laughs> so you put two materials together, you put gold and aluminum together, and suddenly you have a problem that you weren't expecting. So a material mismatch. Last example, back uh, stateside, there was a Boeing, at the time when this was done, it was, a uh, it was called Hughes. Uh, Boeing bought them out, as they have done in many instances. Um, they had a slew of failures on, so basically, Boeing to save money, especially for these communication satellites, they would build one version and they would churn out multiple copies. Well, that's great unless you have a design flaw. And what happened on this is that they were having unexpected failures in this type of spacecraft. Uh, basically, you, this idea of you have a primary processor and a backup processor. This is a standard thing in aerospace. So if one fails, you switch to the backup. Well, again, if you have the same design flaw in both, having a backup does you no good. And that's what was happening here. And what it was, it's something called tin whiskering. So as it turns out, if you take tin and you put it in a very strong magnetic field, it starts to grow whiskers along that magnetic field line, or excuse me, the electrical line. So this is, so this is a relay. So it's a big metal piece that you can physically close to turn it on. You physically open it to turn it off. But there, there was tin elements, especially on some of the solder joints here. And so as you can see, it doesn't really good for your, does you no good to have an open relay if the tin grows across and closes it for you. And that what was happening was that every so often enough tin would whisker across to cause a short on the whole system. This led to a new rule, no tin. And so, in fact, that's what happens with all of these. And so you can see the idea here is freaky effects of physics. Who would expect that a high, a high electric field jet causes metal to spontaneously grow whiskers? Well, they discovered it after the fact. In fact, so there's in fact a, an aerospace saying, the mission is ready to fly when the paperwork outweighs the spacecraft. <laughs> you do as much tests as you can, you do as much design as you can, and you keep going, you keep going, and again, eventually you run out of money or you run out of time and the launch vehicle is going to go and so you have to fly. But back to the original rules, there's always one more test you could do. There's always one more analysis that you could do. There's always a little bit more time you could run this test and it comes from the fact that, and again, I only have six, there are hundreds of examples of we changed one little thing and who knew that would be a problem and it was a problem that killed the mission. This makes aerospace people with good reason very, very cautious because you've spent seven years and you've flown it and it doesn't work and you don't get those seven years back. So again, with good reason, with lots of experience, the aerospace industry is very risk adverse. And that leads us into CubeSats. One more side story. This is a much younger version of myself. That is the engineering unit of a spacecraft we were building in graduate school, and yes, that is my, my dorm room. Um, in the year 2000, how are we going to get this, not this spacecraft, but the flight version of that spacecraft, how are we going to get it into orbit? <coughs> Basically, at that point, we only had a few choices. One was we could go buy our own rocket, 
which in $2,000 was $20 million and up. We were graduate students, we didn't have $20 million. Or you could you know, find a partner and then only spend $10 million. Well, we didn't have $10 million. Well, could you hitch a ride on someone else's rocket? There's often excess space, excess mass on a launch. So maybe instead of spending 10, maybe we give them a million dollars, they stuff us in the corner. That also, again, million dollars is better than 20. We don't have a million dollars. One of the downsides if you're buying a ticket on someone else's rocket is, remember all those orbits and everything, uh, you go wherever the rocket's going. You don't get to say, can you drop me, you know, could you hang a left or go another mile down the road? No, you, they'll let you off where they want to let you off. That may not be where you want to be. The only other option at that point is to convince someone else to pay for your lot, you know. Go, tell, go ask NASA, hey, can we have $2 million to launch our student satellite? It's really cool. They're like, no, we've got millions of dollars that we're spending to launch our really cool missions and, and we don't have $2 million to spare. Um, what we ended up doing is that actually the Defense Department has a program called the Space Test Program that it uses to get payloads in orbit. Uh, again, I don't have time. If you want to invite me back, this is a fun story. We actually donated our spacecraft to the U.S. Naval Academy, and so then it became a uh, U.S. Navy spacecraft, and so we were able to get launched by the Department of Defense. So this idea of the secondary spacecraft, if, you, if your program doesn't have resources or if you're a university, this was your only option. And where this is coming from, again, is that we've got expensive and underweight spacecraft, or excuse me, launches are expensive and they're underweight, meaning when you design a rocket, you design it to launch a certain weight. If the payload comes in underweight, you put ballast on, because all of your math and all of your numbers have been to a specific weight, and if you aren't at that weight, you're going to end up in a different orbit, or something else could go wrong along the way. So there is this idea, and in fact, almost from the beginning of, this, of the space industry, by 1960, we were flying secondary spacecraft. Using some, instead of just using lead blocks, which is normally what we do, we would put a useful spacecraft in that excess ballast space. Uh, and so again, the US Navy started doing this in 1960. Uh, the perhaps poorly named Engine 1 was launched in 1961 uh, through the University of Iowa. So this was the first time that, so before that it was always you know, Navy to Navy, now it was other organizations are getting the opportunity. In 1980, uh, the Europeans started selling space. So this is the first time it became commercial. Then in the 2000s, and we'll talk more about this later because this is primarily where CubeSat started going, you started seeing lots of small spacecraft all being crammed onto the same rocket. Um, I was involved in this launch, ORS-3. Uh, they were very excited. They were holding the record for the most spacecraft ever deployed from a single launch was 29. That record lasted for two days. And then the Russians launched a Dnepr rocket, which had 33 spacecraft. Uh, that record got pumped up to 104 uh, by uh, India in 2017. And uh, there have been other cl close attempts at this record. Uh, in 20, at the end of 2018, on two separate launches, there were more than 60 spacecraft on the same rocket. Um, there have been a lot of secondaries. And more than half of them, more than 800, have been in the last five years. All right, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly through this uh, because I think you'll get restless, uh, but I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of what is a secondary and what is a primary. Um, and the basic idea is the primary, those are the people that are paying for the rocket, paying for their own ride. Uh, they're the ones, and again, these costs are 20 million to $200 million and up. Um, usually they're doing three to seven years in the development of their mission, if not longer. And these are very high performance, highly capable spacecraft. So we're talking about secondaries, we're thinking of much smaller. So instead of a mission that has to operate on orbit for 20 years, it may only need to operate for six months to do its job. Um, instead of spending again $200 million for the launch, we may spend 250,000 or in fact less in some cases. Um, and the idea is that we're building these on a much faster time scale. So if we're talking about secondary spacecraft, the first way you can think to split those is into categories of strap-on and deployed. So there was a spacecraft uh, in the 80s called SurfSat, and it is this box right here. It was attached to the rocket stage, and it was never released. So it was, it was battery powered, it was operational for a couple of weeks. They got a lot of, of interesting experience out of that. 
But generally what you see is you see them deployed. And so these, all of these arrows here on this side are all of the different spacecraft that are going to get released off of this rocket. Um, now to zoom in, there are a couple ways we can build custom interfaces, which is what you're seeing here. You notice that this is maybe a better picture. Um, this one is my satellite Sapphire hiding in the back. Uh, this was another Naval Academy spacecraft. This was a Defense Department spacecraft, and this giant disco ball was called Starshine. Um, but as you can see, every single one of them has a different mechanism attaching them to the rocket, which means every mechanism needs to be tested. Remember, we're afraid. We're afraid that these things are going to shake loose. We're afraid that these antennas are going to fall over and smack into Starshine and scratch it. So you may not be able to tell here, but I've actually wrapped this in the space equivalent of duct tape, which is called Kapton. Uh, we wrapped it up to this height, and then we actually attached what we called guide wires. Walmart fishing cable was used to attach it here to prevent it from falling over and scratching this. I spent a couple of weeks doing all of the design and analysis and the test to prove to NASA that I was not going to scratch one of these mirrors. We're afraid because we have good reason to be afraid. We're afraid because every one of these interfaces is custom built, which means we have to exhaustively test all of them. And in fact, it turned out to be a good thing because, full disclosure, our custom interface had some design flaws in it. And in fact, had we continued with those design flaws, we may not have released on orbit. We caught it in testing. We frantically fixed it. But again, custom interface means time and money. So here's a zoom in picture of, of our custom interface for our spacecraft. So now we can think of, can we come up with standard interfaces? Can we use the same connection for every type of spacecraft so that we only have to do the exhaustive scary testing once? And then we just build that one over and over again. Um, this one is one version. It's called the ASAT platform for the Ariane rockets. Uh, this is an American version called the ESPA. And the idea is that they have a standard ring. And that ring is the same size. And they build the same mechanism adapter to hold it on. Now they can test this over and over. Again, now we can have more confidence that we're not going to have some screwy new failure because we've seen this one used over and over again. And in fact, the light band, which is used here, has now been flown dozens. We may be getting to hundreds of times on orbit, which makes everyone feel less afraid. But we still have this problem that you've got all of these spacecraft hanging loose. This doesn't solve the, will your antenna scratch my, antenna, my spacecraft, or will your spacecraft shake itself to dust and now all those parts are going to fly out and bang into my spacecraft on launch. And that came to the last really important innovation, the idea of a container. So let's put your spacecraft in a box. And now let's make this box really thick and bulletproof. And so even if your spacecraft turns to jelly inside, you can't threaten anyone else because all of your parts are contained. Not only that, but this is going to be a standard size. It's going to have a standard electrical connection. And now we can test it, and we can test it thoroughly. And I can, in fact, now stop worrying about what goes inside the box. Because all the things I'm scared of are now contained inside the box. And so you can make changes in the box. And I don't care. I don't care what you do, because this box shields me from your spacecraft. This was the innovation of CubeSats. Strangely enough, the innovation of CubeSats is not the spacecraft itself. It was the box that it flew in. Um, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but this, these are just some scary photos to show you. Uh, these are uh, an Indian launch and a Russian launch of how you can cram lots of spacecraft in all kinds of places. Uh, if you've got the money, uh, they will launch your spacecraft. So what I've done is we're, we talked about secondaries. We're really focused now on this, this very low end. Can we get really cheap launch, $100,000 or less? Uh, can we do this in a short period of time? Can, and will that open up for lots of people, people to be able to access space? So here's my one chart course on CubeSats. So Bob Twiggs, who was at Stanford, and Jordi puig Suari, who was at Cal Poly, they defined a standard to carry small spacecraft in space. And this was motivated. I can't really say it's motivated by me, because he's never given me credit for this. But our experience with that Sapphire spacecraft was it took us seven years. And in fact, it took us about three and a half years to build it and three and a half years more to find someone to fly it for us. 
Because we na naively thought, well, if we build it, of course someone will fly it. No, because no one wanted to give us $2 million to fly our, our satellite. And so his, exper his experience watching us scramble to try to find a launch was one of the motivations for, well, what can we do to, to make this a better, more accessible experience for students? Because you can imagine seven years, not only has one group of students gone through and graduated, but a second group of students is on their way out by the time this thing is flown. Only because we were graduate students and like me were there forever, did this ever get finished in the first place. And so the idea of the CubeSat is can we make the spacecraft small? So think of this as about the size of a loaf of bread and the idea was that you would fit three in there. So 10 centimeters, roughly four inches on a side. Can you do something interesting that would be a great educational experience but will happen during the lifetime of a student? So three to four years or ideally even less. So as I said, the secret sauce here is the, pe the pea pod, that container makes launch cheap. Launch has never been cheap before. Suddenly it's cheap and it's fast. We can turn these around quickly, we can launch them quickly. Well, and not surprisingly, if you make something cheap, you get a lot of them. So they proposed that idea in 1999. In 2003 was the first CubeSats to officially fly. There were 70 of them within seven years. There were 100 of them within, a, within nine years. And in fact, I've run out of room on the chart, but at the end of last year, the thousandth CubeSat flew. There are now more than 100 of these, and in some cases, 200 of these being flown per year. So again, you make something cheap, you get a lot of them. And this is what I mean. So this is a chart shows there were some early versions of the CubeSat, so that's why I started in 2000. So this is just the number of CubeSats put on orbit. As you can see, it was pretty small. And down here, we were pretty excited when we hit 25 a year. And then all of a sudden, things went crazy. So for the last five years, we've had more than 75 CubeSats flown. And in fact, usually much more than that. 2017 was a banner year, nearly 300. But even last year was no slouch of more than 200. And those numbers are continuing. So what the heck happened? So this is what's going on, what's being built. And again, remember these started as education. We're gonna give the kids something to do. We're gonna teach people how to build spacecraft. These will be a great university opportunity. There's still a lot of them, but it's only 12% of what's being done. There's a lot of these technology demonstrations. Uh, we fly out, we try out a new approach to a power system. We try out a new approach to a radio. We test it and prove it on a CubeSat. Because again, space industry is afraid with good reason. But if you've flown it, if you've worked through the problems, if you've discovered all of the purple plague and all the other things that are gonna to happen to your, your device and you've solved those problems, now I'm less afraid to fly it on my spacecraft. So there's a lot of that demonstration. There's a fair amount of communication satellites being done. Earth imaging, I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but that's the big one that's happening. You can see that's when things really took off, pun intended, that's where you see is all of these Earth imaging spacecraft suddenly taking over. So why do we fly CubeSats? As I said, let's give the kids something to do. One of the things that I like to teach is this idea of systems engineering. This is, I think, an important skill for lots of flavors of engineering, lots of careers in engineering. Nothing is, teaches you like experience, and especially nothing teaches you like making the mistake and breaking your spacecraft and saying, oh, that was a bad idea. Now I see why my professors keep saying don't do X. Now that I've done X and I've killed the spacecraft, I'll stop doing that. Uh, or as Boeing likes to say, we love it that your students break your hardware because then they don't break our hardware. Um, so these are just pictures of different projects, different, uh, some are stuff that I've worked on, some are around the world, but the CubeSat is a great educational opportunity and it fits within the time scales of students. The other one is, is that the CubeSats have kick-started an entire new space industry. So I was talking about all of those, those imaging spacecraft. Uh, the primary instigator of that is a company called Planet. Uh, this shot is from the International Space Station. This was the ejector down here at the bottom are the Planet CubeSats. They were spring-loaded out of this box and are now in Earth orbit. Uh, this is what Planet spacecraft look like up close. They actually mass produce them. Um, and this is the kind of pictures. They're taking pictures of the Earth. In fact, they now have so many spacecraft up there that they, can, they take 
uh, the entire land mass of the earth, you know, so the entire surface of the earth, all of the land, once a day, they're taking your pictures. So in some respects, you can go outside during the day, wave your hand, and it's likely that a planet spacecraft will be taking your picture. Um, they have commercial partners. In fact, uh, NGA, which is installing its, its new uh, site in North uh, St. Louis, is one of the big customers for Planet. So the other thing is, is that in addition to all of this money coming in from Silicon Valley of all of these possible new ways to do space missions, uh, we have a lot of other mission types. Uh, that are fitting the, what I call the missions fit the form factor. It turns out there are interesting things you can do with a very small spacecraft. One of them is this idea of single instrument science. It used to be that if NASA is flying a spacecraft, there have to be 15, 20 instruments all crammed on that because you don't know when the next spacecraft is going to be built. And so everyone who has an instrument that wants to go to that orbit, cr you know, piles on that spacecraft. Now all those instruments have to play well together. Sometimes. You know, an instrument wants to point this way, another instrument wants to point that way, one wants to be spinning, and it becomes very expensive to get all of those instruments to play well together. Now what we can do is we each of them get their own spacecraft. So they go to the orbit they want, they can turn in the direction they want, they're not interfering with each other. NASA is a big sponsor of these single instrument science spacecraft. Um, let me give you some examples here. So just to pick three, there are dozens I could choose from. Um, one of them is called MINX. It was done by the University of Colorado in collaboration with NASA. It studies solar flares, and they've published papers in scientific journals from a spacecraft that's this big, um, understanding the sun, understanding the development of solar flares. From a technology demonstration, there's a company called the Aerospace Corporation uh, on this spacecraft called AeroCube 7. There's a number of them. They've done laser communications, so very high data rate communications on a very small spacecraft. That allows us to do even more interesting science missions because now we can use very, very high resolution sensors and get the data off. So this is an example of the communication, or excuse me, the technology demonstration being very useful. This one called Lemur uh, is from a company called Spire. They're doing, among other things, uh, ADSB, which is a, a code for ship tracking. So ships all over the world carry these transponders, and every few minutes they broadcast their position. Now, that's great when you're close to the shore, but when you're you know, in blue water in the middle of the ocean, there's no one to hear your transponder. Uh, but uh, shipping companies would love to have more accurate understanding of where, there's, where their ships are in the middle of the ocean, especially if there's weather events or, or pirates or anything else like that. And so what happens is with all of these cheap spacecraft, we can have lots of them flying so that there's a couple over the Pacific Ocean at all times. They can pick up those transponders and relay them back to the company so that they can all of the time know where their ships are and know the state of health of their ship. If there's any kind of other dangers or something, they can be alerted to that when normally they would have no idea where their ship was. So again, that's a communications um, a private communications capability that these satellites provide. Now, what I would love to see are the crazy ideas. Because with cheap launch, you can also have cheap spacecraft, which means you can afford to have crazy ideas. Because if they don't work, you're not out years and millions of dollars. And we're just starting to touch on crazy ideas. Uh, so as I say, coming, I hope soon, but someday. The high risk, high reward concepts. Um, I think as a space industry, we're still, for good reason, still afraid to try the new things for fear of, fear of failure, but I think that's one of the things that universities can do. The other thing to point out here is that this is not a US only activity. I apologize, I chose a bad color for the International Space Station, so this is hard to see. Um, so this is, these are all of the, so the colors are the country from which it was launched. Um, it's not exclusive. In fact, almost 20% of all CubeSats have come from uh, Russian rockets, although I don't think Russians have built more than one or two CubeSats out of the 1,000 total. So they're flying CubeSats from other countries. But you can see the primary, the United States has a, almost a third, Russia has 20%, India has 20%, and this white blob here is, is in fact 20% have been released off the International Space Station. They've come up on Japanese rockets, they've come up on European rockets, they've come up on American rockets. So I just 
stick them together to say the International Space Station. So unfortunately, you can't see all the white here, uh, which indicates where they are. But it, it basically is showing that, especially in the last few years, India especially, uh, you've got the money, they will fly you, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. The other thing that I definitely need to point out, because this is really exciting, happened just last year, um, is not only is this international, it's now interplanetary. This is MARCO, uh, one of the two MARCO spacecraft. Uh, so this is a very large version of a CubeSat. It's, you can think of it as a double wide. So instead of being one CubeSat or three, it's actually the equivalent of six stuck together. It has its own deployable solar arrays and it has this massive antenna. And the reason why it needs a massive antenna is because it went to Mars. Um, and Marco served as the communications relay for the InSight lander, which landed this past fall. And in fact, it was an important element of the InSight lander because the InSight lander didn't have its own way of communicating during entry, descent, and landing, which is when most of these, if a mission's gonna die at Mars, it's gonna die during entry, descent, and landing. And so the Marco spacecraft were the communications relay. So while this thing is going through in the landing process, they're using this antenna as the relay to cock back to Earth. Uh, they were tremendously successful. These small spacecraft flew on their own all the way to Mars. They had only propulsion system. And in fact, uh, this is a picture from uh, Marco B, which I believe was named Eve. They were named Wally and Eve. This is this, is this uh, communications antenna kind of viewed from the side here. Um, but that's a picture of Mars taken by a CubeSat. Uh, so we have now left Earth orbit uh, with CubeSats. All right, so let me finally, after 45 minutes, get to the original question. But first, let's talk about debris, because that is a hot topic and I think worth digging into a little bit more. So this chart is courtesy of NASA's uh, Office of Space Debris. If you want to go online, they, they publish a quarterly report on what's going on in space debris. And every year they give a scorecard. And so what this is showing is this is, you know, since 1957, the first launch of Sputnik, till today, this is just a count of how many objects are in space. And these are man-made objects that we can track, which basically means on the order of the size of my fist. Now, we probably can track smaller things, but we're not going to admit to that. So uh, these are what we publicly admit to being able to track uh, and so there's a couple of things. This, this brownish line is the total number of objects that are currently in space right now that we are tracking. You can see that we've reached uh, 19,000. These other lines are what makes up this. And so of that 19,000, this purple line is fragmentation debris. That's things that have broken into pieces. You can see that that's the largest fraction. It's so almost 11,000 of the 19,000 objects are broken pieces of spacecraft or rockets that were up there earlier. These other three lines, the blue one, are the actual spacecraft. So these are the things that we tried to put in space. This green line, rocket bodies, these are the things that we had to put in space in order to put the blue line in space. So when we launch the rocket, one piece of the, of the body uh, uh, is left behind, the, the final stage that gets released. So that's what the green line is. The red line are mission-related debris, which again is, these are the things that we knew were going to be there. So sometimes you have a separation mechanism and some of the pieces may separate out. So you, you know, like if you have an equivalent of elastic band around it, it pops open, that band is floating free. So you can see that we used to do that a lot and now not so much anymore. But there's about 2,000 of those objects, there's about 2,000 rocket bodies, there's about 4,500 spacecraft, and there's about almost 11,000 pieces of fragmentation debris. So let's talk a little bit about the fragmentation debris. Mainly it's when rocket bodies or other spacecraft explode. So the first big one happened in 1966. There was a Titan III rocket on its way up. It got up into orbit and then something went wrong with the propulsion system and it blew into almost a thousand chunks that scattered around everywhere. Similarly, uh, we had another upper stage called a Thorogena, which broke apart in 19, uh, 1971. We had a, the United States did an anti-satellite test uh, back in the early 80s, and that generated about another 600 pieces of debris when we, the spacecraft we were blowing up blew up. Uh, Ariane 1 
was another rocket uh, that broke apart, uh, generating pieces. There was another rocket, a Pegasus, that broke apart, generated a lot of pieces. Now we'll talk about a little more contemporary. Uh, the big one here was um, back in the early 2000s, China de demonstrated its anti-satellite capability by blowing up one of its old communication satellites. Unfortunately, it shows a satellite that was very high altitude. And so you can see that it generated more than uh, almost 3,500 pieces of debris that because of the energy of the explosion and the altitude stayed up in orbit. Uh, and in fact, are all pretty much all still up now. Um, just as a little side story, tying it back to the Sapphire spacecraft, remember that I donated, well, I didn't donate it, my professor donated our spacecraft to the US Naval Academy so that we could be a Navy spacecraft so that we could launch because the Defense Department would sponsor military spacecraft to launch. Fast forward to uh, this debris cloud. Uh, one day I get a very interesting phone call from my friend at the Naval Academy who says, is your spacecraft operational and can you check? Because we've looked at the numbers and one of the chunks of that debris is going to come within the error bounds of your spacecraft. And we'd really like to know whether it was working before and after the launch or after the, uh, the potential collision. Why? Because you can imagine the headline. Ch Chinese satellite test destroys U.S. Navy spacecraft. <laughs> Thankfully, number one, our spacecraft was long since dead. It was only designed to operate for 18 months. It worked for 30 months on orbit, but it had been dead for a long time. So, whew. number two, there's no evidence that there was an actual collision. They were within the error bounds of each other, but the error bounds meant that they were going to pass within, I think, 50 kilometers. So, thankfully, I was not involved in an international incident, uh, but uh, I, I, it was close. The United States, not to be outdone, we did our own anti-satellite demonstration uh, a few months later. We chose a much lower altitude spacecraft, and so we, there was a temporary blip in the number of debris chunks, and then it went down pretty quickly because they were low enough that most of them re-entered the atmosphere within a few weeks. But soon thereafter, we had the first known collision of an operational spacecraft with a piece of debris. So there's an Iridium communication satellite that slammed into a uh, non-functional Russian mission um, and generated several thousand chunks. This one, probably more than anything else, is the reason why we're so, I think, focused. I won't say fixated, focused on debris. The reason is that we didn't see this coming. There are so many objects up there that are, and you, you have an uncertainty for each of them. And the overworked people at JSPOC de never announced to the Iridium people that there was a collision coming. Because you remember that I got a notification that there was a collision coming for one of these debris chunks. They didn't get a, they didn't get a notification because, for whatever reason, uh, errors in the analysis or lack of time to go through the entire list Iridium didn't get notified, so they basically got blindsided by this chunk. And that's the basic concern is that, yes, we have the capability of tracking all these objects, and we have the capability of predicting all of them, but if you're looking at 18 or 19,000 objects, all of whom who might be able to, com to collide with one another, the computational complexity explodes. Pun not intended, but not regretted. Um, so this is, I'd say, the event that makes people the most concerned, is that there's so many pieces up there that we can't always predict when they're going to collide. Now, just by some comparison, there was a NOAA 16 breakup, and in fact, uh, since this is old data and they don't have the numbers yet, there have been a few more objects that fell apart in December and January, and then India did an anti-satellite demonstration of its own a couple weeks ago, which has left a couple dozen new chunks of debris up in orbit. Just by way of comparison, remember that we've got about, there's a thousand CubeSats that have ever flown, about 600 are still in orbit. So on the order of the chart here, that's what we're talking about with CubeSats. So yes, CubeSats are a big number, but compared to 19,000, they're still a relatively small number. So they're not off the hook, but CubeSats are not the issue. Another thing to think about here, uh, this is uh, not my own chart, but just this idea that the higher up you go, the longer you last. 
if we're, if we're at 500 kilometers below, and in fact, 100 is, I think, a generous number. If you're below 500, I'm sorry, those are miles, that's why. If you're below 500 kilometers, which would be more in the 250 miles, your lifetime is going to be very short. Um, I'm sorry, that should be 300 miles. You're going to last a couple of years. So if you're launching new spacecraft and you're staying relatively low, your exposure time is limited. You'll come back down naturally because there's enough residual atmosphere to bring you back. So at these sorts of altitudes, we're not so concerned because you're going to be a problem for only a short period of time. So you can think of this, there's basically three ideas that we have about debris. What should we do about debris? The first one, perhaps paradoxically, is do nothing. It's the big sky hypothesis. Because you think of there's 18,000 objects in a volume of more than, what is that, not 300 trillion miles. I forget the number after trillion. Uh, so 300,000 trillion miles, a cubic miles, or really the average of, if you took all the objects that are in space that we're tracking over the entire volume that we're looking at, you basically put one object in a box and nothing would be within actually 500 miles of it. Because every box would be 250 miles on the side. So yes, 18,000 is a lot, a big number. On the other hand, space is an even bigger number. And so it's still very, very empty. The other way you can think of it is what I talk to my students about the, the car crash analogy. Unfortunately, in all likelihood, there was a collision in St. Louis today. Also, I hope, in all likelihood, it was not any one of us. So those can both be true. There can be lots of collisions and it can, not be you. And so as long as those odds are, yes, there may be a collision in space, but no, it's very unlikely to be my satellite, people are going to be willing to put up with debris in space. So, and the issue is all of the solutions that we can think of to clean up litter in space are not easy. They're expensive. So we think about, well, can we go and grab them? The big space garbage truck idea. For a lot of reasons that I don't have time to get into, the physics make that difficult. And you can think of, if nothing else, for me to launch my garbage truck into space, I have to have a rocket, which means I have to leave a rocket body behind. My garbage truck may break up, may fall into pieces. And so a garbage truck in itself may create more debris than it's rescuing. Because remember also how far apart these are and how fast they're going, it's very difficult for a garbage truck to grab more than a few dozen objects. Big nets have the same kinds of issues related to the physics. Um, we also think of, well, you could use a laser. You could use a laser to heat up one side. It would actually work like a rocket. So you heat up one side and parts of it would ablate, would shoot off, that would slow it down. Of course, a laser that's capable of ablating a spacecraft and slowing it down is capable of disabling any spacecraft. But we promise to only use it for good purposes. So you can, you can imagine the problems that we can run into with that. So our other approach right now is to close the barn door uh, after everyone has left. Um, and so there's a lot of effort to put um, spacecraft in low orbits, that previous slide that I showed you. Uh, there's also a lot of talk now about adding propulsion or big drag elements to try to bring these down. And they've been demonstrated with some degree of success. And so I think if anything's going to happen, you're going to see it in this area. The other thing that I'll point out in terms of wh where are you going to be most threatened by so that, remember I said there's the orbital debris quarterly, and so I just grabbed a random issue, and here are the headlines. Recent satellite breakup, fragmentation of the upper stage of a rocket, a core, ro the Breeze M, which is a rocket body, breaks up near in orbit. Another core stage breaks up in orbit. A Russian unit breaks up in orbit. Or from recently, Intelsat 29E geostationary satellite suffered a fuel leak, it's now drifting, which means it could drift into some of the other communication satellites up there. You're still, more than CubeSats, you are much more likely to be threatened by one of the big things breaking up. In fact, we've had a couple, uh, which one? This one, the NOAA 16 satellite. Uh, what they think happened was one of the batteries exploded and suddenly there were 100 new pieces where there used to be one. So that's the thing that's gonna be you're more uh, likely to be threatened by. So, finally answering my question. Are CubeSats toys? Yes. And in fact, up till 2009, they were basically exclusively toys. Now, as I say there, I would argue that they are those really good educational toys. 
that you buy for your kids and you wish they would play with them, thankfully the kids play with these. So yes, they're toys, but they're good educational toys. Yes, they're definitely tools. As I said, NASA now sponsors scientific missions using CubeSats. They would not waste their money if they were producing substandard science. Uh, Silicon Valley is pouring millions upon millions of dollars into Planet, Inspire, and these other companies because they think that there's a commercial opportunity there. So there are people who are willing to risk their money looking at these as useful tools. Are they a debris cloud? Maybe. Um, as I said, you need to be more worried about colliding with a rocket body, with a rocket body fragmenting. Uh, you need to worry more than the CubeSats. There's a couple of communication constellations on the horizon. One web is starting to launch. They want to fly 600 spacecraft, as many CubeSats as there are on orbit right now. Uh, Starlink wants to fly 12,000, which is a terrifying number when you realize that there's only 18,000 objects there up there right now. As I said, more, worry more about the big sad satellites that spontaneously explode. So thank you very much for sticking with me this far. Uh, before I take general questions, I do want to acknowledge where I'm getting a lot of my data from, a list of public sites, as well as being able to talk to spacecraft developers privately. A lot of the work that I'm doing is sponsored by NASA through its NET program, so I want to give them credit. And then I have a great team of students that are helping me collect and sift through all of this data. So again, thank you very much for time and attention, and I think we've got time for questions. <laughs> yes, sir, I saw you. Put your hand up. Is the purple flag actually purple? The first, yes, it is, in terms of the crystals. Yes, the purple plague is purple, and that's where the, the name came from. Good question. So you've got 30 CubeSats on a vehicle. Yes. They don't all get deployed at the same time. They get deployed in sequences. So you can think of each of them as in their own launch tube. And so they will fire launch tubes every 10 to 15 seconds. So just enough time that they're, they're getting far enough away that they're unlikely to, to recontact. So they're all in the same orbit. Yes, if they're, yes. So for example, when India launched the 104 spacecraft, they were just going out in droves, and they're all relatively in the same orbit. And again, it would be really hard to actually recontact, so they take the risk. Let's go up front, and then we'll. Uh, would it be a problem if we continue to create more uh, space junk debris, and uh, then you couldn't launch a spacecraft anymore due to all the debris floating around the Earth? Yeah, so, so having the debris, especially if you've seen Wally, and there was that, that view of all of the junk that they had to push through, we're, we're far from that right now. Uh, it, it could potentially be an issue, and in fact, uh, there are times where, well, anytime that anyone is launching a rocket, they do do a, a called the conjunction analysis. They look for what's flying overhead for the next certain amount of time, and they will adjust their launch window accordingly. The problem isn't bad enough that we're doing anything different about it. Part of the reason is that the, the ones that are most likely to collide are the lowest down, and so they're going to re-enter within a few months anyway. And so in that sense, the problem is being taken care of. A, an example to think of is, you know, you, especially if you've seen The Empire Strikes Back, you think of an asteroid belt as this almost continuous stream of mass. When JPL is sending spacecraft to Jupiter and Saturn through the asteroid belt, this is what they do about the asteroids, nothing. They just fly through it because the odds of colliding are so low, one could argue that they might increase the odds by trying to do some fancy evasive maneuver. Right now, space is still empty enough that it would be, it, the odds are, are incredibly unlikely that you would hit anything. Um, so I know there's like a certain window for Mars. So yes. If you wanna, so what if, a spacecraft launch in that window, um, it um, broke up and now there's a cloud of debris in that window at all times. So the, the Earth-Mars window is related to the, re the relative position of Earth and Mars, not to this stuff orbiting the Earth. So it would, it would separate out. I had a question over here and then we'll come back. Um, how do they control the, like, where the spacecraft is? Sure. So there are a couple ways to do it. 
most of the CubeSats are actually not controlled, and so they might be tumbling slowly. Um, the, the next most expensive or the next simplest way to do it is you can add some magnets. And so now your spacecraft will line up with the Earth's magnetic field. Um, most, the most like that Minx spacecraft, the most advanced spacecraft, have, uh, they have wheels. And so I know sit and spin is kind of an outdated thing. But the idea that uh, if, if I'm floating in space and I grab something and turn myself this way, the other object is going to turn the opposite way. And so if I have a wheel that's spinning, I can spin it one way and it'll cause the spacecraft to rotate the other way. And so you can get very precise pointing control with good wheels. Was there another question on this side? And then okay, we'll do this and we'll work our way forward. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for good examples. I don't, I don't, I don't, yes, I didn't give an examples because I don't have examples because we haven't gone there yet. I, I'm hoping that people will do that. Yeah? Um, would it be possible to create some kind of walking platform like about the size of a cube set um, that would launch into Earth's orbit and then kind of walk onto some of the other space debris in order to create some that are on? Basically, isn't as much space like out? Yes, it, it is. The, the, the logistics or the challenge of being able to match your speed and find that object and catch up is a tricky problem. So uh, it would be an expensive problem to solve. So that's one way to do it. Um, but I think right now the cost of doing that has made it such that people haven't tried it yet. Yes? Sure. Um, my, my slightly sarcastic answer is not well. We're still waiting for the great inexpensive radio system for CubeSats, and we've been waiting for 20 years, so hopefully maybe someday soon someone will get that. Um, so y it's a radio, it generally is what you're doing. And so in the same way that you know, your FM radio, or your amateur radio here can communicate, same, this is one of the times where the physics actually is in your favor. All of that works. So generally what you have is you have a small transmitter receiver board and you have some antennas. So the Marco example was you had a big reflective array because it has to bounce that signal and direct it you know, a great distance to Earth. Some of the smaller ones, let me roll back here for a second to see if I can, can't remember if any of them had deployed antennas on them. So that was the big Marco array. Um, little harder, actually much harder to see on these. Uh, these pieces right here are shaped what's called patch antennas. And so these are the, the communications antennas that the error cubes were using. Anyone else? Yes? What is your opinion of Pepsi development to use CubeSats for advertising? So yeah, Pepsi's uh, CubeSat, um, or their, their advertisement, I think they've withdrawn, which I would say is probably a good idea. I, I know that if I'm a, a professional or amateur astronomer, the idea of something big and bright and visible from space is a little obnoxious. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's better ways to advertise from and through space. So if, if it's true, I remember seeing a flash news that they had rethought it, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Anything else? Thank All right. You. Thank you again for being out here.